Ordinarily, I produce videos on how to fix electronics, and I understand that publishing a video on this subject matter is an open invitation for criticism, but that's okay. In this very special episode, I want to address a relationship that keeps coming up regarding anecdotal use of ibuprofen or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and clinical decline of patients with the novel SARS coronavirus. The point of this video is not to give widespread medical advice to people I've never met. Those decisions should be carefully made with a trusted medical provider that has a thorough understanding of your medical history. What we're gonna do is start by discussing a little bit about the virus. Second, we'll go over how the virus behaves in the setting of these non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Third, we'll go through a playbook or strategy in the event of viral contraction. As a bonus, I've invited my sister to help summarize my ideas. I will timestamp the video below just in case you want to jump around to certain portions. The 2019 novel coronavirus is a single-stranded, enveloped RNA virus that's shape resembles a pine cone. On the tip of each spine of that pine cone is a spike. The virus uses that spike to anchor and integrate its genetic material into its host. This inoculates or begins the infection. So why mention this stuff and what does it have to do with ibuprofen? Well, the virus can't infect just any old spot. It's like a bee, it needs flower or a receptor for that spike to bind. That receptor is a surface integrated enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2. This is a key thing to remember, and we'll return to this spike protein attachment receptor, ACE2, in a moment. I must admit, the images of the viral structure appear villainous, but from what we currently understand, it is not the actual virus, but rather the body's response to the virus that causes its morbidity and mortality. As the body begins to attack the virus, it releases chemical toxins or cytokines in an attempt to both draw more attention from the immune system, but also to effectively eliminate the organism. The body assumes a degree of collateral damage during this initial attack, and unfortunately that damage results in a high level of inflammation, principally focused in the lungs. With each passing day, we're finding the virus infiltrating new tissue. Piggybacking on the idea that inflammation causes this lung injury, it becomes tempting to reach for a highly potent agent that reduces inflammation, like a steroid or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, right? Perhaps, but early anecdotal reports suggest that patients clinically declined after use of anti-inflammatory drugs like these. Steroids such as hydrocortisone were initially incorporated into packages for intensive care patients during both SARS and MERS outbreaks. Both led to worsening outcomes including more drug adverse events, delayed viral clearance, and more likely to require mechanical ventilation, IV vasopressors, and dialysis. Where does that leave us? Inflammation is the problem, but if we stop it, the patients do worse? My hypothesis is that it is not the reduction of inflammation that is causing the problem, but it is the mechanism of action the drugs use to reduce that inflammation. This brings us back to the relationship between those spike proteins on the virus and their binding site. I believe the link is closely tied to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, or RAS, and is correlated to the increased levels of aldosterone in the body. These increased levels of aldosterone lead to increased binding receptors for the novel coronavirus, particularly in the lungs. Now there are wonderful videos that go into great depth on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, so I'm going to keep my video limited to the realm of the relationship between RAS and the coronavirus. RAS is stimulated by decreased kidney perfusion, which would often be a marker of dehydration, increased beta activity, specifically beta-1, the same stimulus that stimulates your heart to beat, and lower sodium concentrations in the macula densa of the kidney. The steroids used in the hospital for stressful situations or stress-dose steroids are chemically similar to aldosterone. NSAIDs inhibit glucuronidation or breakdown, 
of aldosterone, which would maintain these higher levels of aldosterone. In both of these scenarios, the RAS system's byproducts are preserved. If my hypothesis is correct, any time we activate or potentiate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system or its byproducts, we upregulate the number of receptors, those ACE2s, that the novel coronavirus uses to proliferate, which will in turn stimulate the immune system, which will in turn cause that collateral damage that we are so desperately trying to avoid. Early Chinese data reported a higher mortality for smokers. Smoking also upregulates that ACE2 expression, those binding sites, so it's no wonder they did worse. As a side note, we are all genetically a little bit different, and you'll undoubtedly hear about some people that experience the virus that really struggle, what others are barely bothered by it. This may have to do not only with the temperament of each individual person's immune system, but also the density of their ACE2 receptor expression in the lungs. Since some people take ACE inhibitors and angiotensin blockers, I want to quickly comment on those. While ACE inhibitors upregulate ACE2 receptors, it is not completely understood if this will trigger worse outcomes, especially since these agents have tremendous benefits in other disease states such as heart failure and proteinuria, both of which, if untreated, may actually activate tangential systems that would do more damage. Routine intravascular volume depletion using diuretics may stimulate RAS, which theoretically could upregulate binding sites of that novel coronavirus. So with all this bad stuff, what can we do to improve our odds if we do catch the infection? Well, I'm going to give you the playbook, because we have goals. The first goal is to minimize symptoms. We can do this by using Tylenol to break fevers as best as possible because this will reduce the body's overall sympathetic tone. Second, it's important to support lung function. Regularly expand your lungs using breathing techniques such as incentive spirometers in an effort to limit lung injury, thus speeding up lung recovery. Third, we want to minimize collateral damage. That means we have to avoid steroids unless there's a compelling indication not to. We should be avoiding non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And then we want to avoid anything that's going to cause overall body inflammation. So do your best to limit sugars and complex carbohydrates, which will inherently increase total body inflammation. Fourth, let's limit beta-1 activation. You want to keep exercising to a minimum to keep your heart rate down. Get plenty of rest, which will not only promote recovery, but will also reduce your sympathetic tone, keeping that heart rate down. Selective beta blockers, which block that beta-1 activity, may be beneficial in lowering heart rate and reducing the ACE2 expression. For intensivists, we'll want to try to avoid epinephrine as a first-line vasoactive agent. If the patient is diabetic, it's important to control blood glucose levels, especially avoiding those really low blood sugars, which can activate the sympathetic nervous system. I think it's also important for all of us to limit our stress and maintain good mental health. Fifth, limit RAS activation. If ACE inhibitors are being solely used for blood pressure control, I think a heartfelt conversation is in order with your healthcare provider about potentially switching agents. We also want to avoid any triggers of RAS, so stay hydrated, preferably using salt-containing substances such as soups, unless contraindicated with some patients that have heart failure or kidney problems. And the final goal, we do want to develop viral antibodies to provide immunity. So it's basically, it's not actually the virus itself that's doing the most harm, but rather it's the body's response to that virus. And the body's response is creating increased inflammation in the body, which causes like the headaches and the fever. And so you collateral wanna, damage. And when we want to reduce the fever, then we take an NSAID and what that ibuprofen or NSAID does, I guess, is it 
triggers the this renin angiotensin aldosterone system and increases aldosterone in the body and that's really important because that increases these receptors in our lungs and the virus binds to those receptors thus the increase in the receptors causes an increase in a binding and a proliferation of the actual virus in the body and my other question i guess again was the difference between the NSAIDs and steroids and why they're actually doing something different and as best as i can understand is that if all of these things are based off of this aldosterone chemical, then the NSAIDs, they reduce the breakdown of it, thus increasing more of it. And steroids just mimic it, thus increasing more of it. So either of those two medicines are just increasing these receptors and increasing the repercussions of the virus attaching and binding to these receptors. That's as simple as I think I can. <laughs> That's pretty simple, right? Mm -hmm. I think I guess the most important part for me to explain to people is really that it's not so much the virus that's doing all of the damage, but it's the body's response to that virus. And so we want to sort of tamper or hamper that response and reduce that response so that the body isn't really fighting against itself. Thanks for explaining that, Fubby. Looking toward the future, ideally we'd have an agent that reduces inflammation and subsequent collateral damage without triggering the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which we hypothesize enhances ACE2 expression. Early data using drugs like tocilizumab, an IL-6 antagonist, show some promise. Hydroxychloroquine's been in the news quite a bit, and it may have some inherent antimicrobial properties, but is also an immunosuppressant that works on a different circuit than our steroids and our non-steroidal drugs. Azithromycin is structurally similar to a class of drugs called mTOR inhibitors, which is a line of immunosuppressant that is known to dampen the immune system's activity. This drug may show some benefit. Getting further into the theoretical, zinc lozenges and zinc supplementation, inherently at higher intracellular levels, so inside the cells, zinc impairs RNA viral replication, so that may inhibit the virus from proliferating and taking over some of the tissue. Lozenges may be preferred, as in other viral infections, they prevent viral attachment on mucous membranes, but this property really is unknown regarding the coronavirus. Besides an effective antiviral, the ultimate would be an ACE2 inhibitor, right? One that will block those flower receptors. However, I do have some concerns about that. I wonder if ACE2 breaks down bradykinin and by being bound to the virus, ACE2 is unable to eliminate bradykinin now, I didn't really talk about bradykinin before, but it's a chemical that is known to cause dry coughs, especially in those patients that are on traditional ACE inhibitors. But perhaps that's a different theory for a different day. Then, of course, there's the herd immunity versus successful vaccination that we can all hope for. In conclusion, ultimately, we're still learning about this virus, and anyone claiming to have all the answers at this point in time is frankly an imposter. While it's dangerous to blindly take advice, it's also careless to disregard the theoretical without intelligent exploration. I encourage you to consult your healthcare provider before altering your own medical regimen. And don't worry, I'll get back to my regular fix-it videos. But if there is interest, I'll post updates regarding the virus as new information comes to light, but I really encourage others with access to more resources than me to perform basic science in this promising field. Thank you for watching.